Hey GQ, I'm Dr. Eric Bender. I'm a psychiatrist and psychotherapist, and today I'll be looking at some patients from Earth 616. This is The Mental Breakdown. Thor. So you guys want a drink? What are we drinking? Like a beer, tequila, all sorts of things. <laughs> Buddy, you all right? Yes, I'm fine, why? Why, does it look all right? You look like melted ice cream. <laughs> so what's up? I'm just here for a hangover. If this guy walked into my office, I'd think, oh, he seems pretty jovial, pretty friendly guy. I would ask him how he's doing and have him just tell me about himself. What I'd find interesting is how he was functioning in the past to now. One of the questions I often ask people when they come into my office is, what brings you in now? As opposed to say, you know, two months ago, last year, something's going on for him. And as I talk to him more, I'd learn that. Thor's grieving here. He just went through an incredible ordeal where he had a chance to use his hammer and to hit Thanos and to kill him. It didn't work. It didn't work at all. So Thor is dealing with that loss. Loki has just died. Asgard was destroyed. Almost all the Asgardians are extinct at this point. That is an incredible amount of loss that he's dealing with. So I would say he's likely grieving. The difference between grief and a depression would be that in grief, there is an expected depression almost. There's an expected devastation, a sadness that outside of that grief, outside of that loss, would actually be considered something that needs a lot of attention and would be diagnosable. But after someone dies, people naturally will have a sadness that's crushing sometimes. With depression, there isn't a particular event that's spurring on these symptoms. You might be really down and not have any joy from anything in your life, and there's no reason. Or at least people could say, I, I, I don't understand this. But grief, again, has that initial onset. In talking with Thor, I would find out that that's more what's going on. He's really grieving all of these things. When this image of Thor hit the internet, he was dubbed Fat Thor. That's really actually damaging, not only to Thor's ego, but to people who do struggle with weight. Having a character like this walk on screen and hear audiences just laugh or see him be the butt of jokes, that's really uncomfortable and really awful. People gain weight sometimes when they're depressed. People gain weight when they're not depressed. It doesn't mean that they're useless or the butt of jokes or should be laughed at. People are people. And I imagine that actually he would be dealing with people reacting to his weight. And that's something that can be really hard for people to struggle with. His friends, these Avengers, are a source of support for him. They come to him. They want him to know that they care about him and they also want to recruit him back and say, we still find you useful. We still find you somebody we want to be with. I don't like that there's comments about what he's been doing and his body and his body weight. They're supportive otherwise though. While Thor is grieving the loss of all of these people who've died at the hands of Thanos because he couldn't stop Thanos, also it's important to note, this is the first time Thor's ever lost. He's never lost a battle before. And it's a huge part of his identity that he's somebody who can always win. So the fact that he's lost that piece of him, that's a big deal. A lot of times I'll see people that have a change in something in their life that makes them feel like part of their identity is gone. And that's a big thing to have to cope with. Deadpool. When it comes time to licking wounds, there's no place like home. Oh, and I share that home with someone you've met, the old blind lady from the laundromat, Al. God, I miss cocaine. Her. Fourth wall break inside a fourth wall break. That's like 16 walls. Deadpool is a character who uses humor to cope with everything. In our lives, when we are at risk for having our emotions really challenged or when we can be hurt, we use things called coping mechanisms or sometimes even called defense mechanisms if we think something's really gonna hurt us. And we're not consciously aware of these things. These are things that just we've embodied over time and figured out how to do. There's primitive coping mechanisms or defense mechanisms, meaning they're not very nuanced. One would be projection saying, you're so angry, but actually you're the one who's angry. And then there are more mature coping mechanisms and that includes humor. And Deadpool does that throughout every movie, every comic book story that he's in. Here he's breaking the fourth wall. He's using that in a way to connect with the audience. I think connection in the Deadpool story is very interesting because this is a guy who is pretty much indestructible. He is going to watch people in his life die one by one, whether it's a loved one, whether it's 
a friend, whatever it is, the superheroes will stay alive, most likely, not all of them. And Deadpool doesn't necessarily hang out with them all the time, as we know. He's someone who's coping with that reality. And he's probably pushing that away and not even dealing with it, not even wanting to think about it. We do see how much of a spiral he gets into when his girlfriend is killed in the movie. Again, he's trying to cope with that. He's not gonna address that. This is not a guy that would probably sit on my couch and really wanna talk. He's somebody that I would have to point out again and again. So I know that you're making light of this, but what are you really thinking? And I'm sure I would get back some smart aleck answer where after some time we'd have this dance of me trying to figure out how do I actually get to hear what is going on underneath of this exterior. Some people I know really hate New York City and they walk through the city saying, you know what, I get through it because I imagine it is a movie scene and people are just gonna roll the buildings away and everything's just fake. That is actually a good coping mechanism. That's called dissociation or even depersonalization where you step outside of what's going on in your life. There are times when people who've dealt with a lot of sexual abuse dissociate in the moment even, just to not be present, not to have to deal with it. Breaking the fourth wall might be a reflection of that, how Deadpool does dissociate or depersonalize what's going on in his life right now. So he doesn't have to deal with it. He can break the fourth wall, joke around. He has this awareness. So it's a way to get through all the suffering that he's actually going through. I don't necessarily think Deadpool meets criteria for post-traumatic stress disorder. There's another diagnosis called other trauma or stress-related disorder, meaning that there's been significant trauma it's affected someone's life in a way that continues, how they interact with people, how they function. And that's certainly something that we see here. Green Goblin. So many good things all happening for you, all for you, Norman. What do you want? To say what you won't, to do what you can't, to remove those in your way. Norman Osborn seems to have the onset of a psychotic disorder. He's a bit old for that to happen just naturally. There are usually ages at which you see this present. In males, between mid-teens to early 20s, and for women, you might see later teens to later in the 20s, that's a time of onset for schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is a psychotic disorder, meaning there's a break from reality in which someone starts to have hallucinations. They might hear things or see things that aren't really there. They might have disorganized thinking, there might be paranoia, difficulty with actually interacting with other people, really disordered thoughts. In this case, Norman does hear what seem like hallucinations. He hears this voice wondering where it comes from. People who have psychosis have said, you know, it feels like it's in my head, but I don't want it there. It's, it's, it's kind of being put there, but it's really hard to tell the difference between what's really in their head, what's really external. And we see that in Norman here. He's, he's kind of playing this out. He's almost having a conversation. In fact, he is having a conversation with this voice. That can happen in psychotic disorders. It doesn't just have to be schizophrenia. In this scene, you see a reflection of Norman. So you see him talking as himself, as Norman, and then you look in the mirror and you see Green Goblin, or you hear the Green Goblin, and you kind of see a little bit of a different hairstyle to Norman as well when that happens. That can be a reflection, literally and truly and figuratively also, of different parts of this brain he has. He's got this one that is realistic, sound mind, that's Norman, and then he has this one psychotic voice that comes in. <laughs> and so that's another reflection of what's going on in him, not a reflection of him per se. The voice in psychosis doesn't necessarily have to reflect that individual. In fact, that's often why it's so awful. It doesn't reflect who they are. Coward, we have a new world to conquer. You make me sick. Leave me alone, please. Hiding in the shadows. There are different types of auditory hallucinations. Some are called persecutory hallucinations. And what that means is that the voice is saying really negative things to the individual, really criticizing them, really making them feel awful about themselves. Here we see the example of a persecutory delusion or persecutory hallucination. The voice he's hearing is calling him a coward. You can see he's, he's just so helpless here to that voice and desperately wanting to get rid of it. The smashing of the mask is a desperation of wanting this to stop. And we do see that in real life. We do see individuals who just want those voices to stop. Sometimes they have their hands on their heads saying, stop, stop. You can actually see that in real life. And this is a reflection of his desire to make it to stop. 
The interesting thing is he gets this onset of psychosis from the goblin serum that's been researched here. In real life, there's an equivalent, not the goblin serum, but to actually taking something that makes you have psychotic episodes. There are reports of people using methamphetamine, and for some people, they develop an ongoing psychosis. It doesn't just happen during the time when they're using in those first few times, but actually can even go on for reports of 15 years or longer. So there is some reality to having something cause you to have psychosis. And when I see somebody of this age suddenly having that onset, that's what I would ask right away. Is there any substance use? What's been going on there? Iron Man. Tell me. Wait a minute, Tony. What do you say, Tony? Sorry. Let's check out suit. Okay. Check the heart. Check the check the. Is it the brain? No sign of cardiac anomaly or unusual brain activity. Okay, so it's poison. My diagnosis is that you've experienced a severe anxiety attack. Me? Here, Tony Stark is having a panic attack. A panic attack is a sudden onset of this feeling like things are out of control. Oftentimes people will go to the hospital thinking they're having a heart attack because their heart might be beating faster, they might have physical sensations, a physical tightness, clammy hands. These are similar to the symptoms of a heart attack. He just feels like he is getting more and more worked up. Something's wrong, he's hyperventilating. Iron Man has been through a lot of trauma. He's lost people, he's actually seen things not succeed. All of that's playing a role on his mind. It's on his mind. So it's quite possible that there is a trigger here. It's, it's this building, this building, this building. And then the little child says to him, as he's starting already to develop some panic attack symptoms, and the kid says, how'd you get out of the wormhole? Well, that wormhole is the trauma. And it seems like at that moment, that's when he just gets out. He's like, I, I gotta get out of here. So it's building and then it stops. Panic attacks can be really quick. They can sometimes last for 10 minutes, maybe a little bit longer. Anxiety can go on and on and on and on and on. In his case, because of all this trauma and all the things that have recently happened to him at this point in the movie series, he does have a lot on his shoulders. He's, he's, he's really got a lot he's processing. Oftentimes people who have a lot of trauma will try not to think about it. And one way they try not to think about it is by using alcohol, using substances. They're not saying, hey, let me use substances to stop thinking about my trauma. But some people do have an awareness enough to say, this makes me not think about anything. I don't want to have to deal with anything, so I'm just going to go use this or drink that. In Tony's case, he does have alcoholism, and alcoholism is quite often linked to traumatic experiences, but sometimes it's not. Some people are genetically predisposed to develop alcoholism. It's not everybody having alcohol suddenly becomes an alcoholic. There can be a genetic predisposition to that. And there are storylines, Demon in a Bottle, in the Iron Man lore, where it shows how much this has a grip on him. Hulk? What's really compelling about this is the look he gives. It's such a look of shame when he changes from human form into this green mass. Anger and shame are two of the most difficult emotions that I see people dealing with. Sometimes they go together. People have anger at individuals or at situations in their lives and, and often they don't know what to do with it. Sometimes people are so ashamed of having anger towards others that they don't wanna talk about it. Shame is different than guilt. Guilt is a feeling of I've done something wrong I feel bad about what I've done. Shame is a feeling that you're entirely bad. Your whole person, there's nothing good about you. And in the moments when Bruce is becoming the Hulk, I think he feels that. Is there anything good about him? He can't control this. He's getting to a place where he knows he can't control who he is. And there might be shame over what he might do. Talking to Bruce more about these episodes, I learned that he has repeated episodes of outbursts, that they're not premeditated or thought of beforehand that there might be physical aggression, and in fact there is physical aggression, and destruction. I would start to think, is there an intermittent explosive disorder? That's the diagnosis for anger outbursts like this. We don't know what causes that. An intermittent explosive disorder does fit, and he's really ashamed of that. Looking at 
a different version of the Hulk, David Banner, maybe in the multiverse somewhere else. This can present a little bit differently, but there's other themes here. It's okay. It's okay. That's can you understand me? Can, can you speak? Okay, are you hurt? Sometimes people dealing with anger really do feel like it's out of control. They don't know how to manage it. So you can talk with them about, well, what happens when you get angry? What do you get out of doing that? What are you thinking? What are you feeling? So you can go through it with them and just really understand more. When I see Bruce Banner the second time, he's actually changed his name to David Banner and he looks a little bit different. He's talking to me this time about how he went through a horrible episode where he was in a car and was in an accident and his wife was trapped in the car and he couldn't get her out. She died. And so he became more and more interested in learning about how do people suddenly harness strength to be able to save a loved one in time of a crisis like that. So some of his presentation I'm starting to learn, maybe there's shame over not being able to save his wife. This is incredibly traumatic. So he's dealing with that on his mind all the time. I couldn't save my wife, couldn't save my wife. That's propelled him to study, oh, was there some positioning of the sun such that the gamma radiation out in the environment actually helped someone harness strength? And, and that's what leads to these experiments. And that's what leads him to transform into the Incredible Hulk. An interesting approach from a psychological perspective is that this anger that fuels the Hulk and that he's so ashamed of ends up being a superpower. It ends up helping him do good work. In therapy, sometimes I'm really trying to help people see that anger doesn't have to be a bad thing. They don't have to be scared of it. Something good or productive can come out of it. So there is that theme being played out in these shows and these movies. Moon Knight. All right, oh, hey, oh, listen to me. Oh, listen, no. Look at me. No, Look at me. Not real. This no, is real. I'm real. No, no you're not real. You're yes. not real. None of this. Steven, you gotta give me control. It's the only way. Steven is communicating with Mark. The idea is that this is a dissociative identity disorder, meaning that an individual, often linked to trauma, has developed some way of coping with that trauma. There's another personality. In this case, Mark is one personality. Stephen is the other and they're very different. Mark is considered to be the tougher person and he's trying to convince Stephen, let me take over, let me take over. Moon Knight needs Mark and needs that presence in order to take over and that's what we see here. Could Moon Knight be another altar? That's possible, but there's also the whole supernatural element of this Egyptian god inhabiting Mark. What's not quite realistic here is that an altar doesn't necessarily have a communication with the other altar. There's not a conversation like this and certainly not back and forth. The important part here is to realize there are levels of trauma for the individual that has a dissociative identity disorder. In Mark's case, he has a military background and there's certainly trauma involved in his background. Stephen is a meeker individual. Often the idea behind an altar is that an altar protects the host. Now, whether Stephen is the host, whether Stephen is the altar, you know, we learn those things during the story, but is it that Stephen needs protection? Does Mark need to protect Stephen from this? Sometimes when people shift from one altar to another, there is amnesia. They don't remember things. And often we think that's because they go from one personality state to another, and that explains the amnesia. What you also notice is Mark has an American accent and Stephen has a British accent. Alters can have different personality traits than the host. It's not uncommon to see an altar have a limp or some other physical nuance that the host doesn't have. There can even be reported cases of blood sugar changes with one altar versus another. So that's something that does fall in line with the dissociative identity disorder. Again, here, the main issue is that he's coping with some kind of trauma. And that's where this dissociation comes from. Decision of identity disorder involves multiple alters and it's unclear how someone develops that particular alter. With that idea in mind that the alter is doing something to protect the host, it could be that one alter offers something like a strength. One alter offers something like intelligence. There might be different nuances to each alter to provide some kind of protection or something for the host. Maybe that's an amalgamation of things that that person has seen or taken in. Maybe they have seen other people have a certain strength or a certain way of being and, and they incorporate that, but it's not necessarily conscious. It's something that could be internalized and then it comes out in this way. 
Not everybody who has trauma develops dissociative identity disorder. Sometimes the trauma has been so much, so hard for somebody to deal with that this is a way of coping with that. Some providers have said the goal is to integrate the personalities. The goal of psychotherapy is really to help the individual. So helping them heal from whatever trauma it is, giving them a space to talk about it, figuring out what's really going on, that might result in the consolidation of alters and meaning that there isn't a multiple or diverse group of personalities anymore, but just individuals. Thanos. Titan was like most planets. Too many mouths, not enough to go around. And when we faced extinction, I offered a solution. Genocide. But random, dispassionate, fair to rich and poor alike. They called me a madman. I don't find him to be classically psychopathic and that he doesn't care about anybody because he's actually trying to save the world. Sometimes I would wonder, is there a delusion that he's under? Is, is there a delusion that he's actually gonna save the world by killing half of the population? But in reality, maybe the world is overpopulated. You see in the movie, people supportive of Thanos saying, yeah, he's right. Are they extremists? Is he being extreme? Possibly. So he's a really complicated character. Pretty, isn't it? Perfectly balanced, as all things should be. Too much to one side or the other. Sometimes you can have balance focus in OCD or obsessive compulsive disorder. You can be really obsessed with things being even. So sometimes I will see children who feel like they've moved their left leg twice and then they feel compelled to move their right leg twice. Or if they've touched the doorknob three times on the left side, they will touch it three times on the right side. This is a balancing type of OCD. I don't see that with Thanos. I don't see an obsession here with balance. I see him being very fixated on wanting to save the world by deleting half of it. Maybe it's a cognitive dissonance in that he feels like, okay, I am killing people, that's really bad. I should actually just refer to them as the population that needs to go, but there's no cognitive dissonance here because he doesn't feel a pull. He doesn't feel like it's wrong. He's just doing what he's convinced is right. Loki. The Grand Master has a great many ships. I may even have stolen the access codes to his security system. And suddenly you're overcome with an urge to do the right thing. Heavens no. I run out of favor with the Grand Master, and in exchange for codes and access to a ship, I'm asking for safe passage through the anus. If I ever feel like someone's not being truthful to me or not being forthcoming, I'm often thinking, what's the reason? Sometimes people do get joy out of manipulating other people, or sometimes people have just a goal in mind they want to accomplish, so they are gonna manipulate people to do that. And often that's what Loki was doing. He's trying to manipulate Thor into this or that to get what he wanted. What I think would be most interesting about Loki would be to have had family therapy with Loki and Thor and Odin and Frigga. To talk with that family together would have been really interesting. Thor and Loki grow up with the parents and Odin much prefers Thor, whereas Frigga recognizes that Loki might have this feeling that he can't accomplish anything and she becomes closer to him. This is very often the case in families where a parent has a child, even though they say, oh, there's no favorites, I love all my kids, they have favorites or they have relationships with their kids that they enjoy more than others. Most parents don't go out to do a bad job of parenting, but they overlook something. They overlook that they're not developing the relationship with their child that the child needs. It would be great to hear from Odin, what does he feel about Loki? Why is he drawn to Thor? And we know some of this, but I'd like to hear it directly from the father's mouth. It would be interesting too to have the brothers talk about the sibling rivalry. Kids pick up on things, they're intuitive. Even when those things aren't said by parents, they still pick up on it. Loki's no fool. He's actually really smart and he knows that the father prefers Thor. The father's even sat Thor and Loki down and said he values peace, but one of you's gonna take the throne. Clearly they recognize one of them is gonna take the throne. Well, who's it gonna be? So Loki and Thor from early ages have this rivalry and this disagreement right away. His lying, his pathological lying, his manipulation of other people. Can, can I just, just 
a quick FYI. I was just talking to him just a couple of minutes ago, and he was totally ready to kill any of us. He did try to kill me. Yes, me too, on many, many occasions. I do wonder, is there some antisocial personality disorder traits there? Antisocial personality disorder means you have no regard for laws, you're willing to break the rules, you do what you need to to get what you want. That's what he does. Doesn't necessarily mean if you have antisocial personality disorder, you're a psychopath, which is someone who really doesn't care about other people. They're callous and they just do whatever they want. In fact, we see Loki change over time. He becomes more compassionate. He's exposed at one point to all of these experiences, to his behaviors, both current, past, and future. And he realizes over time that he can be a good person. And you see this evolution of him over time. So that shows a really interesting aspect of this character that he develops and changes over time. He's not necessarily antisocial. That can also be the case of somebody who is showing antisocial traits when they're younger. They call that conduct disorder. When kids are breaking rules and teenagers are breaking the law and not seeming to have regard for it, that can change. Not everybody with conduct disorder develops antisocial personality disorder and becomes a career criminal. So this can change over time. And clearly he does have a change of heart over time. Thanks so much for watching these clips with me. I hope you learned something and I'll see you at our next session.